Okay, so this video is made for AP Bio, topic 4.7. Um, here we'll discuss uh, external regulation of the cell cycle uh, about growth factors, as well as internal regulation, um, like about cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. And then the video towards the end will also talk about errors in cell cycle regulation, which will lead to cancer. So we'll discuss oncogenes, proto-oncogenes, uh, tumor suppressor genes, and um, like, for example, like the RAS protein and P53. Okay, so here we go. When we look at the cell cycle, um, how does, like our big question here is, how does a cell know when to leave G1 or move from S phase into G2 or from G2 into M, et cetera? right? Like, how does the cell know? Uh, and so what we're going to discuss are external signals as well as internal signals. So when we talk about external signals, um, this is going to be growth factors. So when a cell receives a ligand to divide, um, that is an external signal like, hey, time to go through mitosis, time to produce more cells. So uh, common examples of external signals would be epidermal growth factor as well as platelet-derived growth factor. Now, both of these are local regulators that are released from nearby cells, um, and they're going to travel, these ligands, they'll travel a short distance to a nearby cell to turn on, like, gene expression for moving through the cell cycle to make new daughter cells. Uh, and then we have growth hormones uh, that are released from our anterior pituitary. Uh, think about like a growth spurt or something. So you have growth hormones that will travel through your whole bloodstream targeting cells for growth as well. Okay, so when we look at how this works though, so when we mention external signals, like a cell uh, has to receive a signal in or like a I guess it doesn't have to, but generally speaking, it's supposed to receive a signal that it's time to divide. We'll see later in our discussion on cancer um, how a cell would divide in the absence of a signal. Okay, so it'll receive a like a ligand, like a growth factor, whether it's epidermal growth factor, uh, platelet-derived growth factor, etc., and that will activate the signaling uh, pathway or phosphorylation cascade. It'll activate um, proteins within the cell to uh, relay that message all the way down into the nucleus, uh, where the cell response is going to be to activate gene expression or turn on genes. Uh, that produce proteins to control the cell cycle. So uh, let me go ahead and zoom into the nucleus and talk about this a little bit more slowly. So when we talk about um, like the cell response of a growth factor, so when we talk about turning on genes, like what does that mean, right? And so uh, we have an enzyme called RNA polymerase that will transcribe or read a gene in DNA and copy it into messenger RNA. Now, that, that is the those are the directions for how to make a protein. And uh, the protein that we are going to be talking about um, in this are cyclins. So we're going to see how cyclins um, are used to internally like regulate the cell cycle. Ooh, but this is uh, my little picture in my video is bothering me because proteins um, aren't actually made in the nucleus. Uh, this was just more for visual. Proteins are made in the cytoplasm. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So now, though, let's go ahead and talk about this uh, cyclin protein and how it helps to move the cell through the different phases of cell division. So again, to summarize so far, your external signals will be things like growth factors or growth hormone. They attach, attach to like a tyrosine kinase receptor, activating internal proteins um, to bring about a final cell response of turning on gene expression. Those genes, that DNA that is turned on, produce uh, mRNA or like a result in making mRNA that then are the directions to build proteins. So now we're going to see, well, how do those proteins help move us through the cell cycle? And so these are the internal signals that I was mentioning on the first slide. 
So our internal signals are cyclins as well as cyclin-dependent kinases. Now we remember from my video on interphase um, that that checkpoint between G1 and S is super critically like important. Uh, we want to make sure that our cells are healthy and the DNA is intact. There's not any damage or massive mutations. We only want good cells to go through the cell cycle. Um, and so we have this G1 checkpoint uh, to help our cells like stop, pause and check and make sure everything's good. But in reality, like how do we like move through that checkpoint? How come cells aren't always just going into S phase? right? So let's go ahead and see. So here, when we have these uh, external signals attached to the receptor, that'll lead to those proteins um, being phosphorylated and activated within that signaling cascade. And here, the cell response is to produce a protein called cyclin. And this example is the G1S cyclin, but there's actually multiple different kinds of cyclin, and we'll see a little bit about a few of them. So here though, cyclin proteins are what help the cell move from one step of the cell cycle to the next. Um, and they don't last forever, like they're produced and then they get used and then degraded. But what are cyclins, right? Okay. But before we can talk about cyclins and how they progress a cell through the cell cycle, we need to look and refresh our memories on kinases. So a kinase is an enzyme. And what a kinase does in general, are, are, are is kinases, they generally will take a phosphate group and phosphorylate other proteins to turn an inactive protein active. Um, and so they modify other proteins by adding phosphate groups and activating those proteins, usually. Sometimes it might work to inactivate, um, but in my examples, we'll be looking at how phosphorylation activates other proteins. So again, it's the kinase that attaches the phosphate group to activate other proteins. Okay, so now let's go back to that cyclin, and we're going to use an S phase cyclin as my example. So now if you recall from interphase video, how we had the, um, in S phase, we learned that in S phase, DNA duplicates, right? Like our DNA replicates. We start with uh, 46 strands of DNA and we copy them in S phase. But in reality, like that's not just magically gonna start happening right? Like it doesn't just constantly make copies of our DNA. It's not always replicating. You need something to turn on or activate the proteins that will make the copies of the DNA. So here uh, we have this kinase. Now this is a cyclin dependent kinase. And in the name cyclin dependent kinase, they're going to require a cyclin to become active. So these CDKs are in a constant amount in your cell. Like they're all, you'll have the same amount of CDKs all the time, but they're not always active. They're going to require cyclins in order to become active. So here, once this like S cyclin attaches, to this CDK, the CDK becomes active. Okay, so let me summarize. The CDK kinases are always in the cell in a constant amount. But what does cycle, that's where they get their name, are the cyclins. So when we talk about a cell receiving a signal to divide, you have your signal transduction pathway, and then a cell response would be to produce cyclins. And these cyclins are what are gonna help the cell move through the cell cycle by attaching to cyclin-dependent kinases and activating these cyclin-dependent kinases. So now a kinase phosphorylates other proteins and activates those. So now let's tie this back into making copies of our DNA. So here we need an enzyme, actually there's I think about 11 enzymes, but we need some enzymes to make copies of our DNA. So let's pretend this is DNA polymerase, okay? So here, this cyclin-dependent kinase that is active can now take a phosphate 
and activate that enzyme needed for DNA replication. And now once that enzyme is activated, because it got phosphorylated, now it can then make that copy of uh, DNA and make the identical sister chromatids. But that only happened, um, oops, let's go back. That only happened because the cyclin-dependent kinase was active and able to turn on or activate that enzyme to make the copy of the DNA. So if you didn't have this S cyclin, S phase wouldn't have happened. Like you need these internal cyclin molecules or proteins in order to activate the kinases and therefore activate the enzymes necessary for different stages within the cell cycle. Okay, now you also notice here that that S cyclin doesn't stay forever. If it stayed forever, we'd be constantly replicating our DNA and that doesn't happen. So the cyclin um, is only used temporarily and then it degrades. Now you notice that CDK is back to inactive. Okay, so let's look at one more example of a cyclin. Uh, so here, um, when we think about what has to happen in like M phase, for example. So in M phase, uh, we need to write in the beginning with prophase. Uh, the DNA inside the nucleus condenses into visible chromosomes. We have the nuclear envelope breakdown. I mean, there's a lot happening. It, remember those like centrosomes move to opposite sides of the cell? Like a whole lot is going on in M phase and it doesn't just magically happen. There's gonna be enzymes and proteins that are gonna make things go, but you have to activate those proteins. They are not always active. So how do we activate them? We phosphorylate them. And how do you phosphorylate them? With a kinase. Well, how do you turn on the kinase? with cyclins. So now uh, we have this like cyclin that will activate a CDK to help the cell move from like G2 into M phase. Uh, I believe this one might be called like M phase promoting factor. But anyway, so here you have this cyclin and cyclin dependent kinase that's active can now phosphorylate enzymes for M phase. And here uh, we can see like, uh, I believe I have the chromosomes kind of condensed. Let's see. So I don't, oh, look at that cyclin. Look at that cyclin degrade. Okay, okay, look at the CDK go back to inactive. All right, all right. But now let's look at the um, M phase. So then you're gonna have your chromosomes condense. There'd be a different protein for that. I just didn't phosphorylate another protein, okay? Um, and then now this purple enzyme is gonna break down the nuclear envelope. Um, and so when we look at like the big picture of cyclins is that uh, throughout the different stages of the cell cycle, there are different cyclins required to activate different kinases, to turn on other proteins um, or enzymes to make the cell like activities happen basically. And you can see here like the red, like G1 cyclin, it stays, it's pretty, it's used in a lot of steps of the cell cycle. Um, but other cyclins, their uh, concentrations increase and decrease um, throughout the cell cycle. So to repeat, for example, the um, like here cyclin A um, might be like my S cyclin that I talked about, like replicating DNA, uh, for example. And so Cyclin B in this picture, this orange one, I would guess would be the cyclin um, that is activating the proteins to keep your sister chromatids together. So if you keep your sister chromatids together, you see that sharp um, decline in mitosis right there. So once that orange protein, like um, once that cyclin degrades, it's no longer keeping the sister chromatids together, like the proteins there are no longer active and now they come apart. <laughs> okay, so some key things to take away about cyclins is that while the cyclin-dependent kinases, are uh, their amounts are constant, the cyclins themselves will vary throughout the cell cycle. Uh, their job is to activate cyclin-dependent kinases uh, to activate proteins that carry out the cellular activities of each phase. And then those cyclins will eventually degrade. So that phase of the cell cycle is done. And um, we're moving on to the next one. Uh, whereas, and when they degrade, the kinases go back to inactive. 
Okay, so that is the end of like internal mechanisms. Now we're, it's gonna be kind of a long video. We're gonna move on to now what happens um, when there are errors in these cell cycle control mechanisms. Like what happens when there's mistakes and we're not regulating the cell throughout, right? And this is where we can have uncontrolled cell growth, which can lead to tumor formation, formations. And if those are malignant uh, tumor cells, then it could lead to cancer. Sometimes a tumor might be just benign and actually not causing harm. Um, but anyway, so now let's go ahead and see what could go wrong. So when we think about like this picture here, this pathway, this like so much of our well-being and how our bodies function is based on proteins. And we hope that we have like the our proteins fold properly. And as I've talked about a few times in this video and other videos, is that the directions to fold our proteins are based in our DNA. So we have genes and our genes are the directions of how to build a protein. So now when we think about this cell cycle here or this regulation, the uh, receptor proteins, those purple thing, oh, well, first let's go in order. So when we look at it, the genes, the code in our DNA is going to code for different proteins all used in the cell cycle. So, for example, the growth factors are protein based. That's why they attach outside of the cell. They're protein based ligands. So there's genes that code for growth factors. Then we have genes that are going to code for receptors because our receptors are proteins. And then we have the, all of the proteins on the inside of our cell involved in that intracellular signaling pathway. So all of those proteins on the inside, we hope fold up correctly and are present and working normally. Now, if we have mutations that alter any of these genes, then it can lead to cancer and and like uncontrolled cell growth because it's not functioning properly. So let's go ahead and talk about this. So when we talk about like the genes that code for growth factors or the genes that code for receptor proteins or the genes that code for like the relay proteins on the inside of the cell, any gene that codes for a cell division protein, so a protein involved in cells dividing, we call those proto-oncogenes. So like, for example, the gene that codes for these purple receptors would be a proto-oncogene. The gene that codes for RAS would be the RAS proto-oncogene. Or um, the gene that codes for the growth factor would be like a growth factor proto-oncogene. So a proto-oncogene is just the name of any gene that codes for a protein that is used in the cell cycle and cell cycle regulation. So um, normally when it's um, turned on, it codes for the mRNA that then, or doesn't code for the mRNA, but it's copied in the mRNA. And then that mRNA is read to make the proteins involved in the cell cycle. However, sometimes, unfortunately, these uh, proto-oncogenes can be exposed to cancer-causing agents or mutagens. So there's a couple different words. I believe if it's like a mutagen, that's a, like, a chemical or something that causes mutations. Then you have like carcinogen, uh, carcinogens, like so you've heard the word carcinogenic, that means like cancer causing. So like certain chemicals and things in our environment are carcinogenic, which means they um, increase the rate of mutations, which could then lead to cancer. And then, um, oh, there's one more word that's similar. I, I might think of it. Okay, so now uh, you can see here, I have it changed color. So when we are exposed to certain cancer-causing agents, it can cause a, a mutation or a change in those proto-oncogenes. So now, if a proto-oncogene is mutated, and now it's a cancer-causing gene, we call it an oncogene. So a proto-oncogene, if mutated to become cancer-causing, we now call it an oncogene. And this is why in like hospitals and stuff, like the cancer department is called like oncology. Okay, so for example, it could just be something like um, the proto-oncogene was mutated and now it's an oncogene and maybe it overexpresses proteins. So maybe it's producing a ton of proteins involved in cells dividing. So now the cells are uncontrollably dividing, right? So it could be that um, 
it's producing a whole lot more of a protein product, or maybe it's not producing an important protein that was needed to stop the cell cycle. Or maybe the mutation changed the activity of some proteins, right? So we'll look at a couple example of examples of this. So here, um, but what causes these mutations, right? So um, a lot of them are actually caused by things that happen in our lives that we're exposed to, whether it's UV radiation, chemical exposure, radiation exposure, heat, cigarette smoke, pollution, age, and genetics. Um, and sometimes it's just random mutations that happen when our cells divide. Uh, but interestingly, when I was studying this a few years ago, uh, genetics only plays about, I want to say like 10 to 15 percent of the likelihood of developing cancer. Um, depending on what genes you inherit, uh, you might have an increased risk of a certain um, like protein changes. Uh, so basically, by looking at this list, while we can't totally 100 percent guarantee that a person won't develop cancer in their life, uh, there are like certain behaviors and things you can do to reduce your risk or at the same time, increase your risk. Unfortunately, like during the Vietnam War, the humans exposed to like Agent Orange and stuff uh, now in their older age um, are developing cancer at very high, high rates because of certain chemicals they were exposed to or during um, the nuclear power plant like meltdown or explosion in Chernobyl in 1985, uh, the rates uh, from all that radiation that was released, um, the rates of thyroid cancer uh, across Europe in that area um, skyrocketed, right? So anyway, so let's go ahead. And um, so this here, when I, when I talk about genetics, uh, we have certain two genes located on two different chromosomes that can actually um, like increase your, your chance of developing breast cancer, the BRCA gene. Uh, so BRCA is for breast cancer. And so um, nowadays with things like 23andMe and stuff, we can actually have our DNA analyzed to see if you have those mutations that might increase your risk of developing breast cancer. And we can get pre-screened for those genetic mutations and then take action, you know, from there. So anyway, let's go ahead and look at um, a little bit more, like we're going to look at two examples now of how um, errors can actually lead to uncontrolled cell growth. So if there's genes that promote cell division and say, yes, let's divide, right? Like make, let's make some cyclins and activate kinases and divide. Um, are there genes that inhibit or prevent cell division? Well, yes, there are like normal proteins that are like, hold on. We can't pass the G1 checkpoint. Our cell is damaged. Stop, right? Like that's a normal thing to do. We want to check to make sure and stop the cell if there's mistakes. So what we have, we have genes that are called tumor suppressor genes, which I find this hard to like, hard to explain kind of because it's like a double negative almost is what I feel like. So a tumor suppressor gene is a good thing because a tumor is uncontrolled cell growth. And a tumor suppressor gene is a good thing because it's going to stop uncontrolled cell growth. So it prevents the cell cycle. And that's a positive thing. Um, because when we think about like, well, what are tumors? A tumor, uncontrolled cell growth, um, the problem with it is that it like, if we talk about like cancer that has spread, for example, um, it starts to invade other tissues and organs and interferes with the normal functioning of our body. So as these tumors spread into other regions, um, like for example, I have a family member with uh, stage four cancer right now and the tumor has spread uh, the cancer spread throughout his entire body and it's pressing into and going into uh, his kidneys. And so it's interfering with other uh, functions in the body. And so that is uh, how cancer can be so um, harmful and deadly. Okay, so um, let's go ahead though and look at um, two examples that are pretty common in human um, cancers. 
So one of them is the RAS proto-oncogene. And if you've been following my playlist here on YouTube on cell communication, I've mentioned the RAS protein a few times. Uh, but the P53 tumor suppressor gene is new. I haven't mentioned that yet. Um, but in about 30% of human cancers, there's a mutation in that RAS relay protein. Um, and it, in about 50% of human cancers, we have mutations in the P53 tumor suppressor gene. So let's just look at RAS real quick. So we've seen this quite a few times, this diagram. Now the problem here, the RAS, RAS is a protein. And it's a, the normal DNA that codes for this protein is a proto-oncogene. But if there's mutations and RAS, um, the gene is mutated, one of the things that could happen is that the, um, uh, it's now an oncogene, if it's a cancer-causing gene, and this RAS, protein, the way it folds up is its intrinsic ac activity, like how it works on its own. It's like a hyperactive, like it's just active in the absence of a ligand. So way earlier in my video when I was like, sometimes like you need a ligand, but not always. It was in reference to this, like sometimes there's no ligand, but the way the RAS protein folded, if you're like if you've studied protein folding, you have the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structures, like the different amino acids interacting in a new way cause the protein to fold up differently and now be in an active form, even when there's no ligand. So now it activates that signal, like that signaling cascade within the cell to promote a turning on genes that lead to cell division. So you can see here how that RAS uh, protein is really a bad thing because now you have no way to stop this cell from dividing because um, it's dividing without uh, a ligand as if there was a ligand. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at P53 as our last example. So here, uh, P53 is a tumor suppressor gene. So that means, oh, let's stop the cell from dividing, right? Let's not make a tumor and have uncontrolled cell growth. So uh, remember early on in some videos, we talked about how that G1 checkpoint is super important. We only want healthy cells to divide. So this is where that P53 protein comes into play. Any cells that have too much damage in their DNA, we want to stop them and inhibit them at this point. We don't want them going on to S phase because if they go into S phase, then they're gonna divide. And then you're gonna have uh, two copies of abnormal cells. And then you'll have four, and then you'll have eight, and then you have 16, and now you have rapid cell growth, uncontrolled. Okay, so let's go ahead and zoom in here to G1. So let's pretend there's some DNA damage. All right, we wanna check that before our cell divides in S phase. So um, we have, we have 46 chromosomes with thousands of genes. So on a different chromosome or somewhere else, that's not the DNA damage, uh, we have some genes that are going to uh, make proteins that inhibit the cell cycle. Okay, so normal, like this is a good thing. We have DNA that will code for proteins that will stop the cell cycle at the G1 checkpoint. So what does that look like? Let's envision. So remember these uh, cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases? Well, the cyclin, the G1S cyclin that attaches to the CDK to help the cell move from G1 into S phase, right? We want to like stop that cyclin. We don't want to move into S phase if there's too much DNA damage. So what will happen is there's a protein called P53 and the P53 uh, protein so again, even P53 is a protein that was coded for by DNA saying how to make a correct P53 protein. Yo, there's so many genes involved in this. Okay, so P53 is a transcription factor, which we haven't, in my class, haven't learned these yet. But transcription factors are kind of like, you can think about like a light switch or something. Like it's what helps to turn on genes. So this P53 um, is a transcription factor. It helps to turn on gene expression. It helps to turn on the genes so that RNA can be made. So P53 will attach to the DNA. The um, DNA can be copied into messenger RNA. And then that messenger, <laughs> that's a, a funny looking protein, but then that messenger RNA can be used 
a red by a ribosome to make the protein. So now this protein will actually inhibit that cyclin-dependent kinase and stop the cell from going into S phase. So P53 is a good thing because now that cell is like stopped in G1 and a couple things could happen. It gives the cell time to repair that DNA damage. It can fix it. And if it fixes it, then the cell can move into S phase. But sometimes the damage might be just too great. Maybe it's like, um, like huge broken pieces of DNA or something. Uh, in that case, if it's not repairable, then the cell will receive a signal to go into what's called apoptosis or programmed cell death. And so this cell will not pass go, like it will not go into S phase. It will actually like um, uh, die and it will like break apart. The immune system will clean it up, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's good. Like you can see here how P53 prevents um, DNA damaged cells from going through the cell cycle. But Sometimes P53 itself, what happens if the gene that codes for the P53 has a mutation and that protein doesn't fold correctly? If the P53 is mutated and doesn't fold correctly, then it can't turn on gene expression. And now there's no inhibitory protein. And now that G1S uh, cyclin can activate the CDK, it can move into the S phase and that damaged DNA can now replicate um, because there's nothing to stop it. So um, without P53, there aren't any inhibitory proteins uh, produced and the cell is able to divide um, even with the damaged DNA. So again, in 50% of human cases of cancer or human cancers, um, it is due to a mutated P53, like unable to stop the cell from going into S phase. Okay, so this concludes my video. Uh, great job if you're in AP Bio. That is the end of Unit 4. So uh, fantastic job.